Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Amity uh, webinar for uh, June. Thank you very much for coming out. My name is Paul Philp. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Amity. And we're particularly excited this week, this month, to have um, uh, Jason Whitehead and Jennifer McLean Rogan from Triton's uh, Consultants to talk to us about user adoption. Um, Triton's is an IT consulting firm on the East Coast. Uh, they specialize in accelerating user adoption and building out customer success management practices and processes. They've got a ton of experience in, uh, in this area. It's their expertise. And uh, we've been looking forward for a long time to uh, hearing, uh, uh, hearing how they do their magic. And so today's the day. And um, so, um, so let's uh, so, great. So uh, before we kick off, um, a few items of housekeeping. Um, if you want to tweet and, and join the conversation on Twitter, um, you can use the hashtag CSMSuccess and uh, check out Amity at, at GetAmity and Tritons at, uh, at Tritons. And uh, don't worry, right after the, the webinar, within 24 hours, we'll send everyone the deck and the recording of the presentation and we'll leave lots of time for uh, Q&A at the end. Okay, so without further ado, let's, uh, let's kick it off and uh, welcome Jason and Jennifer. Great, thanks Paul. Uh, hi, this is Jason Whitehead. I'm the CEO and founder of Tritons. I'm here with my co-presenter, Jen McLean Rogan. And we're really excited to be here today and, and to share with all of you some of the insights and best practices around user adoption and customer success management that we think um, will be very helpful to you. So um, to get started here, what we're going to cover is um, just a little bit about us to help you understand our perspective that we bring, because it's probably a bit unique and different from what you've heard before, and we think it'll be helpful to understand where we're coming from so you, to, as a lens for the subject matter. And then we're going to jump right into a little bit about the need and why focus on user adoption and, and what is its critical role in customer success management and why it's so essential that you, you understand the need and the manner in which you can address it. Then we'll switch over to talk a little bit about the present and what we're commonly seeing people do today and how they're approaching user adoption and a lot of things that really are not working all that well and effectively so that you can understand some things that may need to change in your approach going forward. And we'll then go into um, the, the future and really share with you some tips and, and ideas around how you can accelerate adoption and drive success within your organization and within your customers. Um, so that's what we're going to cover today. Um, Paul already did give you a quick introduction to Tritons. Uh, we are a user adoption and customer success management consulting firm. Uh, we've been around for over 10 years now and we help a variety of um, medium and large size organizations develop strategies, approaches, and plans and programs for both adoption and customer success management. Um, so that's a little bit about Tritons. And now just a little bit about um, our backgrounds. So I've been in the IT and user adoption space for over 20 years having a background in both finance and coming out of the IT implementation field where I worked for many years doing large scale enterprise software implementations, uh, hands-on practical projects. And the common theme that I found in all of those is it was really easy to get the technology up and running, but it was really tough to get people to adopt the technology and get value from it once it was live. And that really at some point became the focus of my career and I ended up going back and, and studying uh, organization development and human resources and really learning some new practical techniques that you can do to meaningful, meaningfully shift and drive adoption and get that results that you want. Um, so that's my background and, and experience and perspective that I bring to this and now I'll turn it over to Jen to introduce yourself. Thanks Jason. Good afternoon everyone. My name is Jen McLean Rogan. I've been in the IT and user adoption field for about 18 years. My educational background is in business administration and human resource development. And most of my career has involved leading user adoption efforts for large-scale enterprise-wide technology implementations. And I both witnessed and experienced the struggle that comes with trying to incorporate new technology into our daily practices. So as a result, I've made it my career mission to help people identify and overcome the barriers and potential pitfalls that often get in the way of using and gaining value from technology. Great, thanks Jen. 
So um, we're going to start off with talking a bit about the need and why focus on user adoption. Um, as we're going through, if questions pop into mind, please don't wait to, to the end to enter them in the chat window. Just go ahead and type them in now. And when we get to the Q&A section, we'll take a look and see um, to how we can best answer those for you. So I think the real question that we start is, you know, why does CSM even exist? And, and really, why now? And why has CSM become so popular all of a sudden? If you had Googled CSM a few years ago, you might have received a few pages of results. Now if you Google CSM, you get something like 25 pages of results. Why is that? What happened? Yeah, you know, and I think really the big thing is what happens if your customers are not able to adopt your software? You know, they won't get the value from it and they won't renew their subscription. And if your customers aren't renewing, what does that mean for your organization? What does it mean for, for your level of churn and your level of missed profits? Um, and really what we're seeing here is that user adoption negatively, negatively impacts everyone. And so while you may think that user adoption really is up to your customers to have to address that and that it's not your problem, your responsibility, it is most definitely your problem. That's right, Jason. It really feels like technology is just moving so fast. And we're all just running behind. We're trying to keep up. But we can't because we're human. Technology will continue to move faster than we can move, which is leading to some really expensive problems for both software cu customers and software vendors alike. And accelerating user adoption of your software is really the key to driving value and ROI for your customers, as well as driving renewals and profits for you. So let's take a look at the shift in focus to ROI being the measure of user adoption success. So really the um, popularity in subscription software has shifted how customers are evaluating their IT investments. For example, purchasing software back in the day involved a large upfront cost by the customer in terms of purchasing software, servers, and training. And even if that software sat on the shelf collecting dust, the focus was still on minimizing costs rather than gaining value in a return on investment from actually using the software that they paid for. Right, that, that's so true. And um, now with the subscription software, we actually see all that shifting where the costs up front have really gone down and it makes it so much easier for, for customers and organizations today to really try it before they, they buy it at scale across their organization. So this whole try before you buy, you know, gives you that chance to say, can we get the value from it? And then once they actually purchase that initial, initial time and experience it, then at renewal time, they're like, is it worth it? Am, am I getting this value? Did it, did it live up to the, the promise? Um, so what we're finding here is Really that initial purchase decision that customers are making, that's based on hope and expectations for the future. You know, you get a really nice demo from your software vendor of all the things the software could potentially do, um, and that's really typically done in a vacuum. But then when you come to the renewal decision, you're saying, but what did I really experience in my organization? Did it work for me? Um, you know, what's the, the reality that we're getting? And what, what's happening quite often is that customers are not seeing the value that they expected, so they're not renewing. Mm -hmm. In effect, CSM has become popular because no adoption equals no value, and no value equals no renewal. And that's a problem for everyone. So let's talk a little bit about what's not working with user adoption, and then we can move on to how we solve that. So just as a reminder before we um, begin talking about what isn't working currently, um, please enter any questions that you have in the chat window, and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. So here are some staggering stats on the tremendous impact that user adoption, or rather lack thereof, has on your customer success with your software. 70% of CRM projects fail as a result of a lack of user adoption. And 50% of software functionality that's been paid for is not actually used. Currently, we have a client that's implementing a Salesforce CRM system with 20,000 licenses. If they only end up using 50% of those licenses, that's a huge sunk cost for that organization, and it will definitely have an impact on their decision to renew or not renew those licenses when it comes time to make that important decision. And 40% of companies reported that projects are often in jeopardy due to serious challenges with user adoption. With numbers like that, it's clear that user adoption, the struggle is real and it's prevalent, and it's no wonder that a lack of renewals and customer churn is a real problem for vendors. So let's take a moment to discuss what we mean exactly when we use the term user adoption. When we ask our clients, how do you define user adoption? We often hear user adoption is deployment of new technology. It's getting software on desktops. It's training and communicating benefits of the system to end users, which are all really important pieces of a user adoption plan. However, user adoption is much bigger than that. 
User adoption is achieving the measurable business value that you want and you need from your IT investments by enabling people to incorporate that technology into their daily work habits as well as sustaining proper use of that technology over the life of that system. So a great quote that we heard at a conference was, it's not the software that fails, it's the fleshware. And that's what UA is all about. It's about changing human behavior. It's really not a technical issue, which is a common mistake that we see a lot of organizations making. So now that we have a baseline definition of user adoption, Jason's going to walk us through what success looks like. Great, thank you. Yeah, as Jen just discussed, you know, user adoption is really you know, all about behavior change and getting people to use the te technology in their day-to-day -day lives. Second here. Um, but when we talk about what does success look like from the, the business perspective, um, you know, what, what we find is people, your customers go through this process where, hey, we're at the start of a project and sometime in the future we expect to get this great business benefit and return on investment. It may be we can do things faster or cheaper or more effectively, your quality goes up, but there's some reason that we're going to spend a pile of time and money and effort buying, purchasing, and setting up and installing this new system because we think it's going to benefit us over the long term. And wouldn't it just be great and in that perfect world we jump right there and it's very quick and fast and easy. But in reality, as we all know, you spend a lot of time getting systems set up, configured, tested, built all the way through, and at some point your project goes live. And, and typically at that point all you've really done is maximize your sunk cost. You know, if you're the, the organization implementing the technology, you haven't gotten any value yet and you may never get there. It really depends if people use it or not. And typically at this point what we've seen is the, the traditional approach to um, driving adoption is a, a bit of change management largely focused around the initial go live. Typically this involves some end user point and click training and how to navigate the software and typically a bunch of communications where people try to sell their users, users on what's in it for me and the benefits that they'll get from this. And that's really as far as they go. And what, what our clients are finding and organizations are finding and the whole reason for customer success is what happens afterwards is all at risk. There's no guarantee that you'll recover that cost and that people will use the system to deliver the benefits that you want. And with most clients stopping their efforts at go live, this really is a chance. And what we're finding is customers are saying, how do we do this? Where do we need to go? How do we make sure we come up this recovery point and get the value that we want so that we get this ultimate success of the benefits we want? And then the other question becomes, how do we sustain this success year over year? Um, what we find is that the return investment you get on a technology system is just like the return on your investments or your 401k or retirement. You know, you may be up one year and down the next, but if you stop paying attention to it and stop managing your success, you won't have it for long. So it does require a sustained effort to keep that level of success that you want. So when we look at all of that and, and people say, oh, but change management, that's what we need. Here's, what we, here's the typical strategy is that go live, focus, train, train and forget, sort of that go live and go home approach and selling staff on the greatest. And really what that results is low and limited adoption, um, blaming the end user. You know, if we train them and they're not using it, it must be the user's fault or it's resistance. And no, you know, if, if we're not getting that return on value, our customers, they're just not renewing. So if that's sort of the common approach, I think the real question is, um, why focus all of your time and effort on what happens before go live and focus all that time and effort just on the technology when so much of the value is created after? And you know, what we've also found with a lot of clients is it may take them only three months or, or a few months to get a system up and running, but they expect to have it five, 10, 20 years in the future that's a really long time that you've got to prove your value and your worth. You better have a plan and an approach in place to do that. So that leads us to really where we want to focus a lot of our time and effort and where people are struggling the most is the, okay, so what is the future? What, what do we do about that? Um, <coughs> so I think this is really one of those great pieces that we can learn a lot from some good quotes. And one of my favorite is the Mark Twain quote that says, it ain't what you know, you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know that just ain't so. And what we're finding is that a lot of organizations are struggling with user adoption because they really don't understand how to drive behavior and sort of the, the human nature of users as opposed to the technology and, and IT nature of bits and bytes and all that good stuff. And they often believe, oh, well, we know the specific changes that need to be overcome. We have, we've been here a long time. We'll throw some trainings and, and we'll sell people on it. Now that's thinking that you know what it is, but it's really not what needs to be done. 
Um, so when we're working with clients, so much of our time and effort is focused on creating those aha moments for them, whether it's through a training class or through other interactions or deliverables or processes, where they say, wow, we were heading down the wrong path. We need to do something different or we're not going to get the outcome that we want. What does that need to look like? You know, and, and really, um, from a customer success perspective, we're finding so many of the vendors like, wow, we don't know how to do that and we don't know what that needs to be and how to deliver that service to our clients along with their, our software. And that's really where a lot of the customer success teams are, are struggling and looking for help. Right. And Albert Einstein also had a profound quote that can apply to so many things, which is, he defined insanity as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, which makes us wonder why so often when implementing systems, organizations tend to go through the usual motions of go live and go home or train and blame, while still expecting that this time it will be different. Which begs the question, why would the results be better this time if you're doing the exact same things that didn't work last time? So when we're, when we're working with our clients, we're always surprised at how much time and effort they spend on the technology just to see it's to idle because they didn't spend nearly enough time and effort enabling people to use that technology. It's important to remember that introducing new technology, even simple systems, it kicks off a chain reaction of change within the organization. Those new systems come with new processes, policies, roles, and responsibilities, and people need to unlearn old ways of working and develop new ways of working with the system to do their jobs. So getting people to use technology will feel like an uphill battle if you don't understand how to enable, drive, and sustain human behavioral change. Comparatively speaking, the technology side is easy. It basically does what you tell it to do. So a good rule of thumb here is technology is 20% of the work. User adoption is 80% of the work. For example, as part of your user adoption efforts, have you made sure that existing policies and processes aren't co contradicting actual use of the new system? Have new functions and job responsibilities been incorporated into goals and performance plans? Are accountability measures and rewards aligned with your expectations for system use? We often find that companies don't adequately, adequately plan for the time that it takes to effectively identify and resolve those potential barriers to adoption and often go about CSM the wrong way. So Jason's going to help you recognize if you might be one of those companies going about it the wrong way. Great, thanks, and that's such a, a really good point too. People go down the path that they know um, and where they're comfortable instead of saying this is something unlike anything we've been asked to do before, and that really is the case. So let, let's, let's take your points and apply this to customer success, and here's what we're seeing right now is you know, when an organization gets um, challenged to set up a new customer success team, what we're finding right now is they realize, okay, I've never really done this before. I'm not exactly sure what I need to do, so let me start with what I know where I'm comfortable as opposed to saying, hmm, where do I need to do things a little bit differently and what does that need to look like? So typically what we're seeing is a lot of companies first saying, okay, I need a customer success team. I've got to solve our churn problem, our renewals. I need to make some internal changes. Where does this team need to sit? Who does it need to report to? Does it report to sales? Where does it need to go? Um, do, should our staff have commissions and renewal quotas and all that good stuff? And, and really, how do we change our internal operation first? And then it's, Many times we're seeing companies then go, okay, well, well, we've got a team. They need to have some tools and technology. Where can we throw some um, technology to help them drive customer success and drive adoption within their team? And they go there next. And then eventually they start working with clients and they start doing what they know. Many times it's let's do some additional quarterly reviews with clients. Let's really focus on what's the new feature in our system and our roadmap. Um, but what they haven't done yet is say, okay, is this really working? Is this meaningfully driving and changing adoption within our customers and are we getting that upsell and that renewal that we need because of it. So, you know, starting with what you know is a bit like Mark Twain. It's, that's great, but it's what you don't know that gets you in trouble or what you know that just ain't so. Instead, what we recommend and found more effective is saying the first problem you need to be able to solve is how do you make sure you're driving adoption within your customers? What are the tools and methods and steps that you need to take um, you know, a good rule of thumb is if, if someone came in and said, put together a project plan for what you will do to drive adoption starting with the go live and going forward three to five years, um, if you struggle to articulate exactly what those steps and processes need to be, what those deliverables need to be, what the skill set and, and, and level of effort required, you, you may not know effectively how you're going to drive adoption. You probably have some work to do there. So basically we say, get that root cause problem solved first and then figure out from there what are the internal changes you need to make you need to your organization 
um, to sales, service, product management, professional services, implementation, whatever it may be, to support those adoption changes and that customer success. And then from there, then later on, whatever technology and tools and things that you will need to enable that scalable growth of your CSM team. And I think ultimately what, when people start to work on what exactly is their adoption service, what is it that your customer success team does, you know, they often start with um, what they know to do and what's been effective um, from a customer support perspective or from a sales perspective. But what they really need to ask is say, what is it from an adoption perspective that our customers need to do that they can't or won't do for themselves? Where is it that they are struggling to get adoption and where they just don't either have the expertise or the ability to deliver? And that's the problem we need to solve because if we can't get our customers to effectively adopt and improve the value that they're getting, they're not going to renew. So it is our problem. How are we going to resolve that issue? And that's the core piece you need to figure out. And once, once you help them figure out what they can't do for themselves, then you're well on your way to building an effective customer success team. So with that sort of as a, a conceptual background of, where we, of the need for adoption and its relation to CSM and how to get started, we want to share with you guys um, five tips that we think will be very helpful for this. And again, as you're going through, if you find questions, um, please go ahead and enter them in the window now and we'll be happy to address them at the end. Um, but the first thing that we suggest customers do is define success over the life of the system. Don't go down the road of defining success. Um, what we typically see, we ask customers what's success, and they say, oh, it's on time and on budget. If that's where you're going, you're, you're going to be in for some problems later in renewal time. Instead, say, what are the business outcomes? What's that result that you need to get one, three, five, ten years into the future? Because if you can define that and you can get everyone working towards it, you're well on your way. Because ultimately, that definition of success, that's your customer's renewal criteria. That's what they're going to be asking themselves every time that you come to them to renew or to upsell, saying, is it worth it? And, and how do I know? And how do I make sure I'm getting that result? So that's the, the very first tip is defining what success looks like in terms of business outcomes. Yes, that's so important, Jason. And our tip two is plan specific actions that drive adoption. I like to think of driving user adoption <coughs> is a lot like driving a sound system. You need to know what dials and levers to push at what intensity to get the results that you want and need. For example, knowing when to increase leadership commitment and accountability for ROI, or how and when to have those discussions around expectations for using the system as designed. This is not easy to do. The user adoption methods are not a one-size-fits-all. The levers and the dials that you use will vary depending on a multitude of factors. For example, the adoption strategy and approach that you take for a small, fast-moving system implementation of a few weeks or months is very different than the strategy and the approach that you should take for a large-scale imp implementation of a core system over several years. You need to adjust your plans and actions accordingly because turning around a failed system is much harder than getting it right the first time. And with a commonly reported failure rate near 70%, it's clear that organizations need to take the right actions to protect their IT investments. Absolutely. And our next step, tip, tip three, it's as we mentioned before, user adoption is not a technical issue. It's a business issue, it's a human issue. So you need to have the right skills, processes, and people in place who can facilitate the behavioral changes needed to get value from that technology. As you can see from the photo, you can design a perfectly good, easy to use system. But if people don't change their behavior or habits to incorporate that system into their daily routines, then what you end up with are very expensive workarounds, or walkarounds in this case. And we often find that organizations have IT teams driving adoption, which is fine if those team members are skilled in facilitation, psychology, organizational development, individual group change dynamics, all those, um, the knowledge that you need and experience you need to really drive human behavioral change. And sometimes we've seen organizations simply change the title of let's say, system developer to UA manager or customer success manager, which, let's be honest, it really sets those people up for failure if they don't have the knowledge, the skills, and the abilities that they need to understand complex organizational systems and the potential impact of interdepend interdependencies that can either help or hinder adoption. For example, pushing a strategic lever or dial at the wrong time could create a ripple effect of problems if they don't know what they're doing or it could create a ripple effect of positive change when it's done right. Absolutely. You know, Janet, and I'm reminded of a recent um, discussion we had with a client where we had just finished delivering a, a 
a multi-day training course to their IT leadership, uh, and the client executive came up to me and said, you know, we thought this was an IT issue, and what we're realizing is IT is not the right department to really drive adoption. We're the right department to help put the process in place and work with the teams, but it's really going to be up to the business and these other teams to support that, and we need help to figure out how we structure that and move that forward. But this is not a technology issue like we thought it was. It's very, very different. And, and you know, that aha moment for them was huge because now it allows them to go down the right path to really building out um, their team. So I think tip four really then comes to, as we mentioned, you're going to need to make internal changes within introducing CSM. And these can come in a variety of different formats. You may need to change how your sales team is structured and incentivized. You may need to change how your product management team works, how your tech support team works. Because um, when you're working with customer success services and you're delivering this out, many organizations now are making this um, partial of, of it's a free service included with, with their base stuff. But some of this is also a fee-for-service model because it, it requires some high-touch work depending where you need to be. And it's really important that as you think through all this stuff, understanding it's going to change the dynamics within your organization, um, especially if your sales and marketing team needs to actually sell your customer success service or to be able to explain to customers what this service is and how it's different than what they may have been experienced before from technical support or, or service and all those great things. There's going to be a lot of movement within your organization. It's very important that you manage that change as well as you do the, the front-facing interactions with your customer. So you shouldn't um, shortchange the effort required there. And then I think the next and, and final tip that we wanted to share today is really making sure that um, you understand that, that you will probably need different levels of service for different types of customers. Um, what we typically hear is that about 80% of the revenue comes from 20% of, of customers um, and that if you've got a few customers that are delivering most of your value, um, they may require a higher touch, more white glove type service than your lower tier customers which you may have in mass. And you're going to need some tools and technology to deliver those scalable services um, to both your, your lower tier customers but also to provide that support and insight and effectiveness that you need for your upper tier customers. And that's where tools like Amity and, and others and your CRM can be used to try and figure out what's the best way to deliver this service you're going to need those. You're going to need to make sure that you're using those effectively as well too. So that, that's definitely a tip is be prepared that you're going to make, need to make those investments as well. So to summarize where we are, since we just threw a lot of information at you quickly, uh, user adoption, is, it isn't easy to do, but it's incredibly important to get it right to drive value for an ROI for your customers as well as drive renewals and profits for you. So here are some key questions to consider to help you determine if you're ready to drive user adoption and CSM within your organization. Do you know how to help your customers do what they can't or aren't doing to get value from your system? Do you know how to begin developing service offerings, service offerings aimed at changing behaviors? Do you know how to develop CSM and UA methodologies that deliver results quickly? And do you have the internal resources skilled at driving user adoption to quickly build out a CSM program? If you can't answer these questions, don't worry. That's what we do. We can help you. <laughs> we have a variety of service, op service offerings aimed at building our clients' UA and CSM capabilities, such as our Quick Start Strategy Development, our ROI Revenue <coughs> Services for projects that aren't achieving the desired results. We have training, coaching, full program implementation services, and partnerships. We are not a one-size-fits-all company. All of our services are tailored to our customers' needs to accelerate their user adoption and CSM results. If you have questions, please give us a call. We welcome the opportunity to talk with you and help you and your organization succeed with your user adoption and CSM efforts. So we thank you very much for this time with you. We hope this was helpful. Please enter your questions in the chat window and we'll answer them at the end. Now I'll turn it over to our wonderful host, co-founder, and CEO of Amity, Paul Phillip. Thanks, um, uh, Jason and Jennifer. Uh, that was great content. Um, uh, user adoption is, uh, uh, you know, we know it at Amity. All of our customers uh, face that challenge. It's, uh, you know, without without the right processes, without the right tools, it's it's a it's a big it's a big hill to climb. So thank you very much for sharing your um, expertise and experience today. That was great. And um, we're going to uh, head over and do Q&A. Um, there's a ton of questions came in, uh, not surprisingly. And uh, just before we turn it over to uh, Q&A, I'm going to take a moment and um, uh, 
introduce Amity to everybody. Amity is a, a, a superpower toolkit for proactive customer success. You know, it, it really empowers our customers to, uh, um, uh, to be proactive. It's really hard being proactive. Uh, it's really the, the goal that our, our customers have, and it's really difficult. And we work with our customers to help them be proactive. Usually when we come in and start working with our, with our customers, their world looks something like the situation on the left. And we help them organize um, and automate and uh, mine all of those sources of data and all of those uh, different uh, tasks and processes so that they can uh, focus on uh, renewals, productivity, retention, upselling, scalability, trial conversions, all the things which really move the needle for customer success. So uh, Amity is uh, intelligent agent technology that simplifies and automates all of that messy uh, work of customer success so that you're empowered to create more value for your customers. Okay, um, that's, uh, that's Amity. If you'd like to see a demonstration of Amity or find out how Amity can uh, drive value for your customer success operations, just drop us an email after the webinar. We'd, we'd be happy to, to spend half an hour seeing if Amity is a fit for your needs. And now I'm going to uh, turn it back to Jason and, um, and your questions. Thanks again for coming out today. Great. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Yeah, we've got quite a list of questions, and if others pop in, um, you know, we're happy to answer those. And if we're not able to cover everything in the time we have, we're happy to follow up afterwards. And for some of the questions people have entered, um, they're pretty specific to their unique situation, so we'll try and answer them at a high level. Um, but we're very happy to meet with you and talk with you offline as well, too. So you know, please feel free to reach out to us directly, just info at tritons.com, and we're happy to schedule time to come in and, and sit and learn more about your specific situation and share some insights. So I think um, one of the first questions that came in is, I have a portfolio of large clients who are already live and on our software. Are there any tips to assist clients in increasing the user adoption rates? Um, absolutely. So one of the things that we do even before you get clients live is to really come up with what is an adoption plan and strategy that you need to go through. And one of the first things you have to do is to go through and do an assessment to understand the unique needs of each organization. Because um, there will be drivers and barriers that, that encourage adoption and prevent it that are specific to each organization and sometimes within each department within a client. But outside of that, there are a couple of things that I can offer up as, as general high-level recommendations. Um, one, once you've got that assessment and you understand what those situations are, or drivers and barriers are, first do everything you need to to remove a barrier to adoption and understand what is it we need to do to enable users to be successful. Um, and then one of the next steps is to really be very clear and specific in asking for user behavior. It's amazing how many times we work with clients that they train people on the system, they turn it on and they go live and they just expect people to use it and they never even do something as simple as ask them to do it. And it's amazing when I ask clients and say, did you, do, did you ask them and did you measure and did you give them goals for adoption? They say, well, no, of course not. We trained them. So instead what we find very helpful, and it's never too late to start this, though it's better if you do it um, from the very beginning, is come up with specific adoption goals for each user or department or group and have them build on each other week after week and being able to say, so for example with the CRM, this week we want you to enter five accounts, next week we want you to enter three new accounts and update seven contacts. And in examples like that where you give a very specific goal and many users say, hey, I'm happy to do it if you tell me what you want me to do, but no one's asked. So make sure you ask and make sure you're specific. And then I think the final tip is with that, making sure as you're coming up with those adoption plans, start with the easy functionality, the core functionality first, get people very comfortable with adoption and using the system, and then layer on and build up on that comfort to the more advanced modules or the more complex, complex tasks that they may not do very often so that people are already okay with what the system needs to be. Yeah, I think it's really important to help your clients establish momentum, positive momentum, and some short-term wins so that they can see and build their confidence that, yes, they can use this tool to perform their jobs. And then, as Jason just mentioned, eventually getting them to use a bit more of the, or the more complex functionality with time. But start small, get some very specific short-term goals that are achievable for them. 
Um, and I like that you mentioned the assessment. Ideally, we do assessments before go live so you can get ahead of those gotchas, those potential barriers and pitfalls. But it's not too late to do it after go live. In fact, you should continue to do assessments throughout the life of that system so you can determine if there's been changes in the environment. Are there new barriers that are getting in the way of people using the system, even if they want to use it? Um, so yeah, we definitely encourage conducting assessments um, with your clients uh, throughout the life of the system to get right. that information. Yeah, and that's, Where are they struggling? That, that's yeah. so true because one of the situations, and this relates to the next question that I'll read in a second, is without doing that, it's very easy to do a lot of activity that may have no real impact or value on adoption. And until you know what is the specific issue within a user base or an organization that you need to, to address, you can spend a lot of time just doing what you know that may not move the needle. What you it, think will move the needle but doesn't. Exactly, and, and you can't waste that time and effort. Um, which I think leads nicely to really the next question, which is, I understand that people aren't adopting on their own, but are there any CSM tactics and practices related to adoption that aren't working right now, things that we should avoid doing? So um, I can think of, of several, and Jen, I imagine you do too, so feel free to jump in. Um, I think a couple of them are, is what I've seen with a lot of CSM teams is that while they're hoping to drive adoption, what they really do is try and sell people on features and benefits of the future and just sort of say, here's, some, here's another module you could use that could solve this problem, or here's what's next in our roadmap, which it's important for people to understand what's coming so they can align their adoption plans to future enhancements and, and all that good stuff. And that is part of life cycle of, of software that people expect enhancements and, and they look forward to them. But focusing on features and benefits will not change adoption. So if you find that there is an issue with the level of adoption and effective use of the existing modules and functionality, figure out what are the steps that you need to do to solve that problem before you start trying to encourage people to use additional software or new functionality coming down the pike. Right. Yeah, I totally agree, Jason. I think it's, it's a dangerous pitfall that a lot of organizations make, which is to spend a lot of time and energy crafting your message to do the what's in it for me sales approach with end users. Um, whenever we see that with our clients, alarm bells start to ring because that's an easy way out of doing the hard work. Like you really do need to understand from your end user's perspective, what do they need for, to use this technology effectively, what might get in their way from their perspective, and that's the stuff that you need to communicate. That's the stuff that you need to be working on through your user adoption and CSM um, tactics and practices. Right. Absolutely. So I think um, moving on to our next question, can successful adoption happen with my customers in 100% online meetings, or does it need to be in person? Great question. Wow, that, that is a great question. And what we're finding is so many, so many organizations today are virtually based between home-based employees and, and offices around the globe and all this great stuff, that it really is not always practical to get everyone in the same room at the same time and to do it on a regular basis. Um, so I think that's one of those situations where whenever possible, taking advantage of in-person meetings and forums is absolutely essential. And it doesn't have to be a lot of work. A lot of organizations have existing meetings where they do get people in or, or group small subsets of people in at different times that they can do that. Um, but one of the big things that we work with as clients is really putting in place a plan of how will you create this cascade effect out to drive adoption down throughout your organization um, and what does that need to look like. And one of the biggest issues that, that people overlook is the in our experience, the single biggest driver of effective user adoption is the immediate supervisor. They're the ones who set the rules for what, how people conduct their job, um, their expectations for using the software, they're the people who reinforce certain behaviors or take action if someone's not performing as required. And this, the really challenging piece for a lot of organizations is no one has really ever told the supervisor, it's your job to drive effective adoption within your team. Um, very rarely do they go through, it's your job and here's the tools that you need to be able to do this because as a supervisor, this is something you've probably never been asked to do. So instead of um, focusing all your efforts on end user training and point and click software, which is um, firmly in the bucket of necessary but not sufficient, you also need to make sure that you're preparing supervisors for their role in driving adoption and that they're managing as part of their day-to-day -day management of their team. And that's a, a very different approach but an incredibly effective approach um, and very easy to do once you know how to do it. Absolutely. I would say that's probably in the top two 
strategies for accelerating user adoption is, is building that relationship and that trust with the supervisors and the, and the managers and making sure that they are set up for success and helping their staff, their team members, be successful with the technology. They're a very key stakeholder group and they're so frequently missed when people are doing their user adoption plans or executing those plans. Whenever, it, whenever you're in doubt, go back to the managers and leaders and, and get them involved in the planning, get them involved in the execution because you're going to have a whole lot more success if you do that. It will make your job much easier. Absolutely. So our next question is, is there anything people are doing now after the go live point that isn't working? Wow. <laughs> there's, there's so many things we have found that either work really well, don't work as well as people expect but they keep doing them, or really don't work at all. It's probably a, a poor use of time and resources. Um, I think one of the things that, that often comes up um, and this some, is assuming it's resistance and assuming that if people aren't using the system, it must be the user's fault. And what we have found and recommend is when you start to go down that road, there might be a lot of alternative explanations. Um, either it's their legitimate barriers outside the user's control that prevent them from using the system even if they want to um, that you need to remove, or perhaps your adoption methodology has holes in it and you need to adjust that up in some way, shape, or form as well. So I think that's a good one um, to think. Um. Yeah, I agree. I think user, user resistance is, if you start hearing that term used a lot within your organization, that it's a sign that there's something bigger um, happening. Uh, user resistance, there are typically things that are preventing them from using the system. It's not usually an act of self-defiance, which is often how it's, how it's labeled. Um, for the most part, you need to do a bit more digging to find out what's really preventing use or effective use of that technology. If you start hearing the term user resistance, um, it becomes more that it's a dangerous label because it becomes a scapegoat or it, it covers up some of those blind spots so you won't actually be able to see what are some of the, those root causes that are keeping people from gaining value from that technology. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. That's really important and people don't realize that user resistance shouldn't be the end all be all solution or answer to a lack of user adoption. It's a signal that you need to do more work. Right. And, and I think you know, one other piece that jumps to mind very quickly is um, having a very static user adoption plan and assuming that the things that you need to do around the initial go live and the first launching the system will be the same things you need to do to sustain effective adoption three, five, ten years down the road. Um, you know, Jen mentioned this as well too. Your organization changes. The external um, environment changes. New regulations come in. People retire. People get hired. Um, you need to make sure that, especially when you have new people hiring and people getting promoted and transferring around different departments and switching job roles, um, what you need to do to, to get those people effectively using a, a live system that's been in place for several years is very different than what it takes to convert people over from an existing system to a new one. So you've got to have a method by which you can take and survey you know, your current needs, understand what's changed and what's going to change. Um, and another issue is typically, you know, once one system goes live, more technology products typically follow behind that. It's, it's, it's not just done. And as people start focusing on new systems, part of the challenge is how do you keep people focused on maintaining effective use and adoption of the current system as well. So if you're, if you're implementing CRM in, in one system, you better make sure that when the next ERP project or HR or billing or SharePoint or whatever else it is, that all the energy doesn't go just to that and suddenly use of CRM goes down. It's really complex. Um, <coughs> the next question we had is, can you talk more about CSM adoption methodology? Where do you start? So we actually have, a, one of the things that we train our customers on is, here's an adoption methodology and approach of where you need to go to, to one, help your customers drive that adoption within their organization. And it involves from going right up front of that defining success and what are, what are the business outcomes we need to have, and then how do we cascade those into very clear, measurable um, goals that employees can work towards and say, yep, this is what I need to do, and this is how I'm going to adopt the software to get there. The whole process by which we go through and help people um, understand what are the specific actions and, and, and assess their needs around the steps and deliverables that need to happen. Um, and then really go through and developing that plan on how you need to execute that. Um, we actually, with a, one large client, we were brought in um, probably six months before um, <coughs> uh, they even issued their RFP for their new software vendor because they knew adoption was such a critical need for them. 
they wanted to get ahead of putting in place a strategy plan and program for how they would drive that because they were spending millions and millions and millions of dollars on the software they needed to get a return for that. So we were able to come in right up front and say this is what it needs to look like and here's how we adjust this program and approach for your specific organization in need. So from an adoption perspective, that's how we, we sort of address that issue. And then when you're building out a customer success team, you've also got to layer onto that, okay, so how does this map into services for adoption? How do we recruit the right skills and team that we need to do this? If we're going to actually charge for any of these services, um, how do we plan what that needs to look like? And how do we work with sales in our internal group, internal group to lay out that strategy and approach to make sure ultimately we're not doing this for fun. How do we make sure we do all this to get that business outcome for our clients and for our organization as well too and make sure it's profitable. Um, but the big message here is there is no one size fits all and it's very specific to your, your organization as a, as a vendor and your specific clients that may be in different tiers as well too. Okay. So here's a question. What advice do you have for when user adoption is a product or technical issue? When the product just doesn't, um, product just doesn't have the functionality to do what the business needs it to do. So it sounds to me like if, if that's the case, then there were some discussions that didn't happen up front to get the right tool for the business needs. So I think that you know, goes back to one of our first tips that we shared is that you need to define what success is for that tool up front and be very clear and specific so everybody knows this is what we're trying to achieve with this tool. If that's not the right tool, then of course user adoption is going to be an issue for you. Right. Um, I think the other piece too is um, the question I would ask is how do you know that it's a, a product issue or it's a software issue because that may, be, that may be a warning sign that oh we're assuming it's this but there could be a, an alternative explanation or cause. Um, so there are many times I would say let's go and validate that assumption first and if it is indeed the software tool um, I think you need to adjust the level of expectations that you would have around the return that you'll get from that. and really be able to pinpoint say what is the appropriate level of use and effort we should put into to doing this tool or is it time to think if there's another tool as a better alternative and you know without specific information about the situation it's hard to offer up a more concrete answer but I think those are just a couple of, of things that jump off. And I think one of the things that, that's really helpful in figuring out after Go Live if this tool really isn't going to meet the business needs is setting up what we're calling a learning community. So after Go Live, getting, getting end users together to discuss what's working well, what's not with the software, what's making their jobs easier, what's making their jobs harder. And through those discussions, you can share best practices, um, you can share thoughts and suggestions and ideas on maybe this isn't the right tool and maybe we should be looking at a tool that does X, Y, or Z. So making sure that one of those key activities you do um, before, during, and after Go Live is build that learning community, that space in which people can share best practices related to use of that system. Right, absolutely. <coughs> so uh, here's an interesting question as well too. How do you escalate the lack of usage within a, with a, a client while not looking like a tattletale? <laughs> you know, that is such a great, great piece. Um, some of the, the work that we do with clients right up front when measuring that what does success look like and cascading down those goals is coming up with the, what are the metrics we're going to use to measure adoption over what time frame and who do we share them with and what does that need to look like? And really how do you make sure that you're incentivizing and, and rewarding and people for achieving or exceeding adoption goals or hold, holding them accountable if they miss them? So when you put in a structure of a process and a methodology for here's what it is and here's how, how we're going to track it and measure it and communicate and get everyone to agree on what that process needs to be, then it's much easier to work through what are the actual numbers and how do we address that. And you know, many times, again, what you may find is if there's something that's a low adoption level um, with any given client or department, you have to do a little more work to figure out what is the reason before that because it could be that there's something preventing people from wanting to and some customers actually say, I'm so glad that this is now surfaced because now we can address this problem. If we get this out of the way, we can get a much better result for our department and the entire company. Um, so it's not always a bad thing, but really having that process and structure in place is pretty key. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let's see here. Here's one for, for Jen. Do you have any specific user adoption techniques that you're willing to share? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Beyond what we've already shared in the, the earlier five tips, I think one of the 
One of the techniques that we use that really accelerates user adoption is having very proactive, frequent, consistent engage engagement with, with your end users. Try to avoid just doing that one-way communication information sharing at them, but rather bring about the opportunities in which you can gather information from them. That's going to give you the information you need, like I said, to avoid those gotchas before they get you. Um, and the only way you can really do that is to have consistent and frequent communication with the people that you're expecting to use that technology. So for me, that's always been um, kind of my go-to technique. When I feel like things aren't going the right way or we're not getting the results that we're expecting to get at that time, that's when I go back to the basics and say, we need to start engaging our end users again because something got missed along, something got missed along the way. Right, absolutely. So our, our next question is, um, what are the best ways to encourage user adoption and engage executives to help their teams embrace adoption? Wow. <laughs> so that's also one where you know, the best ways will vary by organization because it's not a one size fits all. But one of the things that we found very effective right up front is being very clear in articulating whose job is it to um, drive adoption and be accountable for it, and then how do you go through and help them develop a specific plan and actions and steps to do to, to make sure that actually happens. Um, with a recent client, again, you know, the big aha for them was adoption is not a technology issue, it's a business issue, and it's a performance and behavioral issue. We're the wrong group to do that. It's got to be the supervisors and the executives of the business units who can do that, but they need help because they've never done this before either. So, so much of, of that needs to be really working with the executives to make sure that they understand their role in, in effective adoption and why it's so important from a financial and business outcomes perspective. Um, you know, with companies spending such large amounts of money on software, expecting to get a real return for it, um, this is a huge business outcome and financial issue. And once executives have that aha, then they're like, okay, now I need to get ahead of this. What is it I can do? And when, I've, when it's been clear that I'm accountable for this, how do I make sure I'm successful so that I can deliver the results that I want that may be aligned with my, my incentive plan, with looking successful in front of my, my peers, all of that great stuff. And they're actually eager for help. And they're like, tell me the steps. Give me feedback. Help me out here. What else can we do? Is this enough? Oh, here's some other great things we could do. Let's go make that happen. But really the, the first piece is they need to understand the link between adoption and business outcomes. And they need to understand that link between those outcomes and their responsibility for making sure they achieve it. Then once that aha happens, then they're really eager for help and process and, and putting in place those structured plans and activities um, that they can do and that their teams can do to really move and sustain adoption. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also making sure that their commitment is observable. Um, we find a lot when working with clients that when they have a document that is, is distributed to employees with the CEO's signature on it, that, that to them is leadership commitment. But I think where that goes wrong is it needs to be more than that. People are going to look to the leaders to see if this is a priority. Is this something that's really important to, to our organization as a whole before they start paying attention to that initiative? So trying to make sure that you're coaching leadership and saying we need some observable actions to show your commitment, such as you know, maybe you need to put more resources or a larger budget behind this project for it to be successful. That's a very clear indication to employees that, wow, this is something different. They're putting some priority and emphasis onto this initiative, so I need to pay attention. This is going to be hitting me at some point later down the road, and I want to be prepared for it. So making sure that you help your leaders see where and how they can, they can demonstrate commitment. Great. All right. Well, um, we, we appreciate everyone else. I think that we're out of time now. We've had some really great questions, and we appreciate all the interest and excitement here. Again, um, if you have specific questions or would like some more information, um, please give us a call, info at tritons.com or 703-652-0887. Uh, and, and I'll turn this back over to, uh, to Paul. Great. Thank you very much, Jason. Thanks, uh, Jennifer, and thanks everyone for all your questions. That was a, that was a really amazing content-rich uh, 15 minutes, so that, that uh, flew by. And uh, that's the uh, end of the webinar. I'd like to, to thank uh, Jennifer and Jason again. Uh, great content. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. And uh, just to let you know what our next webinar is, 
uh, the, it's in two weeks, July 13th, and um, I'm going to be hosting and presenting uh, that webinar. Uh, it's an exciting uh, topic that really is um, a hot topic with all of our customers. It's how do you demonstrate the value that your customer is receiving? And um, we'll, we'll go into all the aspects of that. We'll see you in two weeks, and thanks again for coming out today. Thank you.